Hello and welcome to Choose a Five. Today on the show, I have my friends Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington from the Mile High Five podcast. And they reached out to me about a conversation we've been having just in person at the Economy Conference and over email and things like that about an extension of the skill of spending conversation that we first had with Pete, Mr. Money Mustache on episode 432. And we're talking about spending for happiness. And this being the logical extension of where the conversation is going in the financial independence community. And we've seen many phases over the fairly short 10 to 15 year modern FI movement. And it seems like this is where many of us are thinking and many of us are talking about this spending for happiness. And let's be clear, this is not a conversation of three rich 40 something guys sitting around talking about extravagances and how we can blow our money. This is what I believe is three guys who have been very intentional with their money throughout their adult lives and continue to be intentional, but we're learning how to spend for happiness instead of optimizing every dollar for savings rate or keeping up with the Joneses in the FI community. So I think this is going to be a wonderful conversation. And with that, welcome to Choose That FI. Gentlemen. Welcome, Doug, for the first time. Welcome to Choose a Vi. Carl, Mr. 1500, people might know you as, so you are Carl Jensen, Mr. 1500. Welcome back. Yeah, Brad, thank you so much for having us. I am super excited to talk about this today. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And yeah, so Doug, obviously, wanted to introduce you. Give us uh, a little background. I know many of our listeners are Mile High Five podcast listeners, so people might already be familiar with you, but just give us a two-minute background if you can. So pumped to be here. I've listened to Choose FI for years, and it was a pleasure to meet you in Cincinnati as well. My background started in corporate uh, kind of hell. You know, <laughs> I didn't enjoy my gig too much. I did uh, management consulting, worked at Accenture for a few years, played around there for about 10 years before getting laid off in 2015. Luckily, a couple of years before that, I started dabbling with uh, side hustles. Found Pat Flynn from Smart Passive Income, got into niche sites. And then when I was laid off in 2015, found my way into entrepreneurship. And I haven't looked back since then. So I kind of came into the FI world sideways. So came in through all these podcasts, slowly found my way to Mr. Money Mustache, just got lucky and moved to Longmont, Colorado, where I met Carl at the co working space and the whole crew. And then I got sucked in by the whole five movement. So <laughs> I interviewed Carl a couple of times. We had a nice conversation, decided to start a podcast about two years ago called Mile High Five. That is awesome. So I suspect what's interesting, you, you mentioned niche websites. I suspect we were in the kind of the same world because I've mentioned in passing here on the podcast that my first really entree into building websites and entrepreneurship was a bunch of these kind of at the time it was what people were doing. But it, in looking back, it's kind of like what's known as gray hat or maybe even black hat SEO gaming Google to get your sites ranked high. And I did that. And frankly, I learned a lot and I learned a lot of things not to do. So it would be it would be interesting to uh, compare notes at some point in the future. But I am curious. So you moved to Longmont just by sheer happenstance or like, did you realize that Longmont was like a, a center of the FI community? I was aware. I listened to the Tim Ferriss show when Pete was on it in 2017 and we were living in Bozeman, Montana at the time. My wife got a job offer down in Boulder, but it's pretty expensive there. So Longmont was kind of high on the list. And we were aware of the area. I worked in the Rocky Mountain National Park in college for a couple of years. So love the Front Range area. Thought I may end up back here sometime anyway. And then just the stars aligned. And the thing is, I knew the co-working space was here, but it was a full six months before I even thought, ah, maybe I'll go check it out or something like that, which seems crazy because I know people are on road trips across the country and they'll take a few hour detour to just walk in front of the building, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. And this building, just to catch everybody up for sure, is the Mr. Money Mustache HQ or world headquarters. And and Carl, I know you're a, an owner in that with Pete, which is absolutely awesome. I'm curious, Carl, you before we hit record, you were the one who mentioned that that phases of FI. And I'd love for you to kind of catch us up with how you think of the arc of the FI movement, because it truly is a worldwide movement. And it's interesting because many of us like you and I met 10 years ago 
online on your blog or on Pete's blog in the comments. And many of us have been on this journey for most of our adult lifetimes. And we've seen it change and we've seen our own selves change. And I think that's where this conversation is going to go. So I'd love for you to give an overview of, of how you conceptualize those phases of the FI movement. Yeah, I, th I think FI has changed so much since you and I first started talking. I remember when I discovered Mr. Money Mustache, part of the reason it resonated with me was because it seemed like everyone in the FI movement was kind of like me. It was a middle-aged computer programmer or engineer type of person. And I'm like, hey, look at this, a bunch of people who love efficiency and look exactly like me and do the same thing as me. And thankfully, it is much better than that now. We're, we're much more diverse. And there's people doing things other than computer programming, which is great. But the other thing I think is interesting, Brad, is it seemed like, especially at first, the focus was this hardcore frugality, right? We discovered Jacob Lund Fisker. And I remember he talked about, I think, living in an old lady's attic. I'm probably misquoting this or a basement and living on $7,000 a year, I think was the number. And that resonated with me too, unfortunately. <laughs> like, this is great. If I was in his position, I'd be doing that exact same thing. And you look at the arc where things are now 10 years later, and I think we're, we're much better adjusted. It's not this race to the bottom where all we want to do is save money and accumulate this amount of money as, or this huge amount of money as quick as possible so we can retire and stop working. It's more about let's use the money for happiness. And there's a ton of value in learning how to save and invest, but it seems like we have moved past that. And maybe we're thinking more about how to intentionally use the money we have. And the other thing is maybe not trying to accumulate a whole bunch. And that's the whole goal. We have slow fi now and coast fi where we're living better along the way where we still have jobs and make peace with work. Yeah, I hear you. There's so much in there. So I think first, that original caricature of people in the FI world being essentially white guys in their 30s who are engineers, which frankly, Carl, you were part of that caricature, right? I mean, as I see it, it was Pete, Brandon, the mad scientist, and you who were three of the very early popular financial independence blogs who all had a lot of things in common, right? And, and most of those portions that hit the caricature. And I think that was maybe, again, just happenstance, but regardless, it did stick a little bit. And I think we have moved beyond that, which I'm thrilled about, obviously. And I think, and I'd like to believe that our podcast has had a lot to do with that of kind of democratizing FI, making it seem less scary. And we've tried to make it less about any particular, you have to do X, Y, and Z, you need to ride a bike, you need to whatever it may be, right? Like save 79 plus percent of your income. Like, okay, well, that would be wonderful if you could, but if you are saving 20% of your income, 18%, 25, whatever it may be. Well, that's fantastic if you've made choices, right? And taken action. I think, I think when we've reoriented it around that, it's made a big difference. But let's be clear. I think we are going to talk about this spending for happiness. But I think all of us, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Doug, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but all of us would still say, for all the new people listening to this podcast that are in the FI community, maybe first six months or a year, Learning that skill of spending, as Mr. Money Mustache would say, on the front side of being being frugal and cutting things that you don't value, so things that are maybe frivolous that have built up over years, that is critically important. We are not trying to downplay that at all and say, you can just spend extravagantly from day one and just go on living your life and say, I'm fine. Like, it doesn't work that way. You need, you need to optimize on the front side in order to have the space to think about what do I want my life to look like? And then how can I potentially maybe loosen that spending a little bit on the backside? And, and Doug, that, I know that's kind of a declarative thought and sentence, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I have a couple ideas around it. And one of the things that's really interesting is all three of us and a lot of other people in our position became really effective at saving money and being frugal. And it's good to be successful at something. And when you become good at something, you want to do more of it and keep improving, which puts you in a spot where it's really hard to start spending money. So luckily, I didn't have as strong of a frugal gene as, as many of us in the community. <laughs> so I was okay like spending here and there, but I was almost always really conscious about what was a high priority for me. So 
still. I haven't upgraded my my car in a very long time. Cars are not super important to me. So I have like a 15-year-old truck that's been paid off for over a decade. So not a high priority for me, but a couple other things for the people that happen to have seen the video before, I have a couple of nice guitars, which I've started to like buy nicer guitars. So that's something where I get a lot of joy out of it. It's fun to, you know, buy the guitar too. I won't lie to you. There's a little <laughs> retail therapy, maybe slightly unhealthy. I dig that part. I like the shopping part. I think it comes from my mom's <laughs> side of the family, but I can also use these guitars for something social, right? I could go play some music with some other friends, which gives another benefit. I could also take like guitar lessons, for example, and use a different part of my brain and really get a lot more of enjoyment out of it than just the purchase. And then I'll throw it in a case and never use it. I play them all the time. So that's just a little example where if you're conscious early on, you will be okay to spend a little money because hopefully you will be successful in whatever, 15 or 20 years, right? Carl and I didn't start spending money a lot until really more recently. We were addicted to saving and now we're kind of opening up just a little bit. Yeah. And that addiction to saving is, well, maybe that's better, obviously, than, than some addictions. I think, nevertheless, there is that in the FI community where we are addicted to saving and it's unhealthy. And I, I still hear from people in my own life, oh, I know that's not very FI. That's what people always say to me, like as if FI means you have to be ultra frugal at all moments. And anytime you deviate, you're not being FI. Like, that is not the case at all. It's as you talked about, Doug, you're building this framework of a life that is based on what you value. And I think this is the critical part because some people value cars. Like I think of the three of us, Carl is the only one that, that might fit that. I don't at all. It would stress me out to have an expensive car. I don't want anybody scratching the thing or hitting it and like just having to worry about it all the time. I don't want to worry about anything that I own. Essentially, I want to own virtually nothing. But there are people who love that and love their cars. And that's great. Do your thing. But you have to understand there's a finite pot. Obviously, you can always grow your income. But realistically, at the current moment, there is a finite pot of money. And you need to apportion your spending in a way that still allows for a significant savings rate. And I think for me, it's always been, okay, can I build a framework of a life that just doesn't cost that much? And that meant for a very long time, living in a house that we could very easily afford. We essentially found the least expensive four bedroom house in the exact school district we wanted to live in. And it was the least expensive by a fairly significant margin. And we drive old cars. We used to eat in essentially every single meal. And when you do that, okay, well, that's normally makes up 50 to 60% of people's budgets, those three items, then you can afford to go out for happy hour at a brewery or do other little, little extravagances and not have to worry about them. And that's how I've always thought about it. But Carl, I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you think about the framework of your life spending? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Probably the biggest spending experiment I ever had going back to the car was the Acura NSX that I bought several years ago. I think this was back around 2016. I was always a car guy growing up and that was my dream car. So I went out and bought this thing to see if it would really bring happiness. And there's a big NSX guy in Boulder who has meetups with everyone who has these cars. And I went to the meetup one time and Everyone had their cars parked out in front. Meanwhile, all the car owners were in back of the house. We couldn't even see the cars and we're just enjoying barbecue and conversation. And that was the best thing. It wasn't actually owning the car that was the best thing about it. It was engaging with the community and people with similar thoughts and talking cars with other people who cared about this. And I thought about that. I'm like, wow, I probably wouldn't even need to own this thing to have this conversation. We could still meet up and not having that. So, Brad, you asked me about my framework of spending, and uh, yeah, I still care. My day-to-day -day life isn't much different, but when there's things I think that I can spend money on, and I think the things that truly bring me joy are things that bring people together where I can see people, maybe here in Longmont or other places, that's what's important to me. And also spending time with my kids, but it's time with people and maybe unique experiences with those people. An another great one real quick, which I'll throw out there is I went to visit Brandon, the mad scientist in Edinburgh. And once we got there, we didn't spend money on much of anything. We walked around the town and had a beer here and there and, and dinner out a couple of times. But 
what made that trip so special was spending time with him and the conversations with our friends. It wasn't actually a thing or I guess it was kind of the experience because we had to go somewhere to get this experience. So that's what really matters to me at this point in my life. It's spending my money to get good experiences with friends and family. I just bought a cruise for my family actually too, uh, about a week ago. Oh, wow. That's very cool. Yeah. What about you, Brad? What's your framework and when did you start to loosen up the purse strings? It's a good question, Doug. I I think for me, the framework has always been what I described a a couple of minutes ago, which is, all right, if we can get those major expenses to a point where we don't have to think about them, or essentially they're zero, like our our cars were were zero. We had 2003 Honda Civic and Toyota Highlander for a very long time until we recently upgraded to 2013 models (laughs) of each of them. So we're still talking 10-year-old cars. But uh, yeah, so I think for me, that afforded the opportunity to then be able to spend on things that matter to us. Like for us, for instance, our daughters were both really high level swimmers for a time. And they both joined this very expensive year round swim club. And it was something we didn't bat an eyelash about because that was something they really valued, really, really enjoyed. And again, for a time, and they're not doing it any longer. But I mean, that was an extraordinary amount of money. And we just, we didn't think about it. We don't ever question travel expenses. And now, obviously, you guys know that I pursue travel rewards and have millions of points and miles. And that clearly helps to an extent, but I'm not ruled by those points and miles to the extent that, all right, listen, if that doesn't fit into our travel plans, because right, sometimes you can't be flexible or some of our money rules. And I'm thinking about something that that Ramit Sethi put out recently. And I was able to find an older version of this, but He had something where it was like his money rules about saying yes. And I think he's updated them since, but he talks about just these very specific things that he will always spend money on. So in this, and this is from last year that I found, never question spending money on books, health, appetizers. He actually has a a funny family story about that. That's why that's in there. Donating to a friend's charity fundraiser. And he says, I will always spend business class on flights over four hours. And I think this is actually kind of a cool framework for us to think about it. And maybe we can't think about it on the fly here while we're having this conversation. But for all the listeners out there, if if you're hearing this, think about maybe some non-negotiable spending rules for the opposite side, right? Not for the, okay, I'm going to cut this. I don't need that. And just thinking about it as a a deprivation mindset, but a, a money abundance mindset of what are things that I would always spend money on or what's worth spending extra money on? Maybe. I think that might be the frame that we want to take just this broader conversation into is like for me, I have a bit of a sleeping issue when it comes to waking up to an alarm to get to an airport. So I pretty much, unless there is an absolute no other way, I will not take a flight before 8 a.m. And even that would be pushing it. So I just, it won't happen because I know I will not sleep and then it will ruin my trip or unless I absolutely couldn't avoid it. And in most cases you can, I don't think I'll ever take a red eye flight ever again in my entire life. Because I know it sounds crazy, right? But like, it's similar to the Ramit thing of, hey, if it's over four hours, I take business class. Now, I'm not sure I could get there right now. I like where he's going. And I think that's kind of where I'm thinking of, all right, what's worth it to spend extra money on? And we'll talk about this later, because I know, Carl, you have a an interesting story about spending on experiences. And when it comes to music and concerts, actually, and you you have a fantastic story. But I recently took an impromptu trip to New York City, actually. This was one of these really, how do you think about spending and kind of the advent of the book Die With Zero that we've talked about a bunch of times. And that's really opened my mind up. And I'd like to talk to you guys about that too. But okay, obviously time is finite. And as we said, we're guys in our 40s and I I don't think of myself as, as old by any means. But when you read Die With Zero, you realize there is a finite amount of time you have to do things. And I think that to me was one of the most fundamental portions of that book of, and and I've said this so much, my audience is probably bored to death with it, but I'm not going to climb Mount Fuji when I'm 85. I'm probably not going to do it when I'm 80, 75, maybe 70, you know, so you keep backtracking of, okay, I'm 44 now. I've got 20 X years to get it in. Right. Or this trip that I took, I saw Bono, uh, the lead singer of U2 was doing this very intimate performance. It was kind of a pseudo book tour and a concert that he was doing at the Beacon Theater in New York City. And 
it just sounded like a once in a lifetime thing to see Bono with only 2000 people in the, in the stands instead of 80,000, essentially. I looked into it and I was able to buy tickets off StubHub. They were a couple hundred dollars, which is not cheap, obviously, but it was fantastic. I was thrilled. I was able to get my flight using points. I found a fairly reasonable hotel and I just did it. And it was a 24 hour trip up and back to New York City. And it was awesome. And it was so unlike something I would have done 10 years ago. And that was just really cool. So I think one of my kind of money rules now is how can I find these maybe once in a lifetime experiences and actually do them instead of just hemming and hawing or saying, oh, no, I couldn't do that or coming up with the litany of excuses and just doing it spontaneously. Brad, that's a tough one to follow. That <laughs> sounds pretty awesome and amazing, especially sounds like you pulled the plug pretty quick. But going back to Ramit's list, one thing that I almost always do now is I like to cook a lot. So food's important. I get a lot of joy out of it. I like smoking barbecue. So you could share that with friends, a lot of good benefits with cooking. And if I see something in the grocery store, I almost always buy it. Even if it's something pretty expensive, I see a nice steak and there's been you know a couple of times where I'm like, all right, there's a big tray of steaks. I'm going to get it and share it with some friends. Like I went over to Carl and Mindy's and there were several people. It's really fun to do that. And it's way cheaper than buying it out. So we don't eat out too often. Occasionally we splurge, but yeah, for anything in the grocery store, I will buy it because it's so much cheaper than buying it out. I do enjoy eating out, but here's the little frugality piece that I have is like you buy a couple drinks, you do get a couple appetizers. A brunch costs like $100 now. It's so expensive. Like the, the last time we went out, it's like everything is so much more expensive and uh, I guess I am showing my age complaining about like, oh, <laughs> Back in my of, day. Yeah. Price of eggs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That same thing. We don't eat out too often, but when we do, we make it really special. It's something like maybe a green Thai curry that <laughs> despite my best efforts, I've not been able to replicate with my own cooking skills, which are very, very minimal. But yeah, stuff like that. We don't bat an eye uh, buying people beer. And I think I, I bought a bunch of people a beer at Economy. Doug, did I buy you one too? I thought I did. Probably beers just kept showing up. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know who half the people were, but it feels good to do something nice for people occasionally. Yeah. I love the Bono experience. Uh, Brad, I wish you would have told me about that. I would have gone with you. I've read oh, the book. Man. I know exactly what you're talking about. That sounds incredible. It was amazing. And so, right, it's called Stories of Surrender was the, the book that he came out with. And Carl, they did tape it, and it's going to be on one of the streaming shows. It was a remarkable performance. It was essentially a two-hour, one-man show of like a play in essence. It was actually choreographed and it was like a remarkable stage act just with Bono. And I think he had a harpist and a cellist and that was it. It was really, really cool. So everybody look out for that if you're at all a fan of either Bono, U2 or just plays in general. I thought it was really awesome. So keep an eye over it. It could be on Disney Plus or something like that in the in the coming months. But yeah, next time I'll keep you updated. I think maybe Las Vegas might be in the future. I know U2 is going to be playing there, which is cool. And yeah, we're talking about food. And I think this is a big one for people. And I know this has always been one that was an issue for me. And I think there's some level of, you know, the uh, the psychological thing, the maximizer versus the satisficer, where essentially the satisficer finds, and that's an odd word, but it is satisficer. They try to find the first thing that fits their loose requirements and essentially closes up shop. So picture looking at a menu instead of looking at every single thing, and that would, would be what the maximizer, and going back and forth and agonizing over it. The satisficer pretty much finds the first thing that they're happy with, closes it, and then they don't have to have that mental anguish of, what am I missing out on? So I think I've always had some of that, certainly. But also, and, and it sounds weird to say this out loud, but in my own head, when I used to look at a menu, I used to almost discount, like just throw out the most expensive items. Like I could never, I'm not someone who would ever buy the $30 steak or the $24 piece of fish or something. This again, Doug showing how dated we are, right? Those might be normal <laughs> prices now, but, but back in the day, I just would throw out that portion of the menu. I just wouldn't look at it because that wasn't something that I did. And again, it sounds silly to say that because maybe it is a special occasion. Maybe you're doing something. I, we don't go out to eat that often. Why am I, we're talking about dollars, like a couple of dollars in the cosmic scheme of things in a month or a year. Is it going to matter that I got the steak that was $7 more than the piece of chicken? No, of course it's not. It's not at all. But yet 
I limited myself in that manner. And I wonder where else I did something similar. That, that's the most vivid because it's so visceral of like literally seeing a menu, right, guys? And like just throwing out the bottom third of it. But it, nevertheless, it was real. And I, I, I think another thing, like you guys are talking about eating at home, just almost by definition, eating at home is going to be dramatically less expensive than going out. So therefore, maybe you can loosen the purse strings a little bit. And we've both my wife and I have really focused on our health and fitness over the last number of years, but it's been accelerating more in the last year or two. And now we're much more cognizant of the ingredients and the type of meat and beef that we're bringing into the house and a lot more just grass fed beef and, and such. And I know when we go to Costco, they have these amazing like multi-pound packages of grass fed beef. And I just use that now as like, I'll open it up and just have that for a bunch of meals. I, I eat kind of weird meals sometimes. So I'll have that for, for a lunch and a dinner a couple of days in a row. And it's just great. It's there. Yeah. Is it a couple dollars more per pound than it would be to eat the ground beef from Food Lion or Publix? Yeah, it is. But I believe that it's better for me. And also just there's something about the convenience factor of having it there, which is great too. So I think there's a lot in there, right? Convenience is, is yet another thing that I think we're all probably spending more money on as well. And I want to jump in and go back to just, you know, the dollar amounts, even with your example for the grass fed beef, it reminds me of uh, chatting with Brandon, Matt Fientist. It was a while back when we had him on the show, but we talked about how we treat $10 or $20 right now while we're all in our forties, we treat it the same as when we were in debt in college and we think, oh, $20, like that's a lot, probably need to take care of that a little better. But when you look at our net worth now versus what it was, that threshold should be way higher, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Like we wouldn't treat it the same, but, you know, we treat $7 the same as we did when we were kids, when we were 20. And it's really hard to like switch gears and treat it a little bit differently. I mean, I still have a tough time, even though we're talking about spending a little bit more money. What's your threshold, Carl, where you're like, oh, this is a lot of money or this is not? Yeah, it's the, uh, I would say it's the same thing. I still think about stupid little purchases and why it's a waste of your brain power. You only have so much mental bandwidth, especially me. It's probably really minimal to think about stuff <laughs> during the day. Why waste your time and money comparing prices of the ounces of cheese in the grocery store? But I, I still do that sometimes. Now, other times I'll just go crazy and buy the toll milk because that's really yeah. good. But yeah, it's silly. Even Bigger expenses. I remember I wanted to see the grills at Red Rocks, the show, and um, it sold out instantly and tickets were like 75 bucks. And then I went online and all the resellers were selling them for like $200, which was still cheap, but I didn't pull the trigger. And now I look back, I'm like, you idiot. You could have seen this great band for 200 bucks, but I was anchored on the $70. And maybe that's part of the problem, Doug. Maybe we're anchored in a place that we shouldn't be anchored at. Maybe we need to learn how to pull off those anchors and throw them out the window or into the sea or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think that's important. And and Doug, you're right. Uh, on a percentage basis, I think we need to somehow update that. And, and yeah, I've heard Brandon mention that as well, where you're just, you're still stuck in that mindset of when you were 22 or 25. And, and that's not to say, obviously, that people who are 22 and 25 aren't intelligent adults who know what they're doing, but like we've updated our thinking over then. And we've also Obviously, our net worths have grown dramatically, and a hundred dollar expense is not the same percentage of our net worth at twenty five as it is at forty or fifty or thirty five whatever the number is. So I think there's some threshold that you need to really think about because otherwise you can get stuck in that and you can get stuck in the every penny or for me, the one that always it really bothers me is like the price of gas. Like if you ask me like what's my biggest pet peeve in the world, it's people obsessing over the price of gas. <laughs> Like I remember going to Belize and we had this amazing tour guide. And the very first question when he said, oh, what do you want to know about Belize? Some dopey American asked, what's the price of gas? I'm like, are you kidding me? Who cares? This is such a penny wise, pound foolish idiocy. And like, or, the, you know, somebody who will drive around to save five cents or 10 cents a gallon, but drive 15 minutes out of their way, which is miles of gas that they're wasting. And more importantly, time. Guys, our time is so finite. People are constantly talking about how busy they are, but yet we fritter away time. And I think conveniences, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, Carl, this is something that I'm definitely thinking about. I'm curious, 
do you think about, I know you're a DIY guy and that's, Doug, I suspect you are as well, but I, I know precisely that Carl is and just how much he is. And are you okay outsourcing things now? Because I suspect there was a time where you wouldn't have been. I am, but it's a very recent phenomenon. And I've, I've got a good friend who I've hired for a bunch of jobs when I can get them. Uh, part of the issue I have with outsourcing it is it isn't so much the money, it's finding someone who will do quality work and actually show up and return phone calls and have communication skills, which could sometimes be difficult to find depending on the job. But I am now, but it's been a difficult thing to come to. And maybe I'm too much of a control freak. I think the problem is all with me. But yeah, Brad, I've learned to let go, but it's a uh, recent. <laughs> are there any conveniences that you guys are spending on that? So Carl, it sounds like this is uh, you're, you're in the early stages of this, but Doug, is, is this something that's crossed your mind in terms of, okay, I'm willing to pay for X, Y, or Z that maybe I wasn't okay with spending on years ago? I need to think of a few additional examples, but I know just anything where I can save a little bit of time or negativity, like inconvenience for me. So around here, there's a toll road that goes to the airport and it's there's hardly any traffic on it. So it's a much more pleasant drive than driving through the city. And I think it costs, it's like 12 or 14 bucks round trip. So it's not cheap to take that road for a, you know, a 45 minute one way drive, but I will take it every time because traffic really, uh, it really brings me down. I, yeah. I get um, not road rage, but I'm not happy out there. No, <laughs> I'm not happy, especially in, you know, stop and go traffic. And I will always take the toll road. So anything where I can avoid something that's negative uh, psychologically for me, I will do it. The other thing is in the past, maybe I would have not taken an Uber or something like that. And I would have tried to take like public transportation or some cheaper option but that convenience is awesome. You know, you don't have to wait around so much. You can get a ride right away. Usually it's a little cleaner than like a cab or a bus. <laughs> so things like that. Anything where I could save like a few minutes, even if it's a lot more expensive than what I would have spent a few years ago. And on that, I have one question for you, Brad. And if yeah. you answer no to this, and this is something I've recently come to, which Brad, I'm telling you, I was living life completely wrong. So I hope you have the right answer to this. Do you have TSA pre-check or global entry? Oh, you bet I do. Oh, I didn't sign up for that until recently. And then I signed up and I was so stupid because I'd be at the airport like with Doug and he's through security like 15 minutes before me or our friend Chris. And I still was resistant to it. And finally, <laughs> I pushed myself over the edge. Okay, good, good. We can yes. continue. No, that is an amazing thing. And yeah, we've talked about TSA pre a couple of times recently with uh, Ginger on some of the Roundup episodes that I've done. So yeah, if you're listening to this and you don't have TSA PreCheck or Global Entry, you really, really, really should look into it. A lot of credit cards offer that as a free benefit. So you can use that credit card to pay for your fee. And it's like, it's generally somewhere in the vicinity of $100 for five-year membership. So even if you had to pay for this thing, it's well worth $20 a year. But you can often, with many cards, you can just Google this really easily, just get that enrollment fee waived, essentially. They'll, they'll just refund it back to your account. And yeah, that is something. It's huge. I mean, Carl, I saved, I think coming back from the Bahamas, we saved about 90 minutes with Global Entry back wow. in the US. It was remarkable. We were through customs in under a minute just from having Global Entry. It was awesome. And even if for if you're not an international traveler, TSA PreCheck is just critical. It's just, and it just feels good, right? Like it feels <laughs> nice to zip through the line. So yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, it's interesting. Doug, you mentioned like a couple things about maybe parking or an Uber or taking a, a more expensive route and, and not worrying about the whatever X number of dollars, 10, $12, because it's going to save me a lot of time. And as part of this Bono trip that I took, this was like a mental experiment for me, guys. So I actually had this thought, how could I act like a rich person for this 24 hours? And this was in my very low key way. And it, it sounds so silly, but like I have never, the Richmond airport is virtually empty. And they have economy parking. It's like 6 or $7 a day. And it's amazing. When you park, the shuttle is like right there, like following you to your spot because there's nobody there. And they just zip you back over to the terminal. It's great. But then I noticed, oh, there's this, there's this daily parking lot that's right next to the terminal where you don't need the shuttle, which, yeah, even though it's great, it takes 10 or 15 minutes. It was like $2 extra a day or something like that, 2 to $4 extra a day. I'm like, I'm doing this for a 24-hour period. What would it feel like to just park in that lot? 
for the first time in my life. And I know it's so silly and it sounds pathetic that I'm hemming and hawing over $4, but it's just something like I'm not the type of person who does that because it's so easy to park an economy. I don't need that. I don't need the convenience. But you know what, guys? It felt fantastic to park in that lot, to just walk directly to the gate. And when I got off the flight the next day and came back home, I just walked straight to my car and it was great. And it cost me, yeah, probably $4 extra. It was so silly, but it just, it made a difference. Or when I was in New York City, flying into, New York has, I'm from Long Island, so I I can say this affectionately, like terrible, terrible ways to get from the airport to Manhattan. And if you're flying into JFK, at least there's the air train and you can kind of get there. But LaGuardia has always been terrible. But now they added some, I don't know, LaGuardia link or something. And you have to take a bus to the subway. And it, it sounded like a big hassle. I was like, oh, that, yeah, that wouldn't be that bad. But should I do that? Should I take an Uber? And it was like, all right, this is 24 hours of being a rich person. I'm just going to take an Uber. And it was, it was expensive. It was like 60 or $70. But you know what? It wasn't a big pain in the butt to do this bus to the subway. And I just did it. And that saved me a good bit of time. And you know what? I actually got to see Paula Pant and Barbara Sloan in New York City and hang out with them that if I'd wasted that hour or two, I wouldn't have been able to. And that was well worth any amount of money that I spent extra. So the reason why we're giving all these examples is not because I want someone to emulate this exact thing, nor your guys' examples, but it's so you, the listener, are hearing this and trying to think of ways in your life where, oh, how can I build this in? How can I think of little things that I can maybe spend a little bit extra on, but that are going to dramatically increase my happiness or save myself time or make my life easier, right? Guys, this is what we're trying to do here. And I think we could all probably sit here and regale people with with stories of this, but it might be something to think about. Look for pain points in your life. And I'm curious, since you guys asked me, like, are there pain points in your life now that you've identified that you'd like to potentially spend on? but that you haven't pulled the trigger or you just can't bring yourself, but you'd like to. Yeah, I'll I'll go first on that one. We have a, the car I drove over here is a 2010 Mazda 5, which has been great. It's got 206,000 miles on it, but it got pelted by hail, which I don't really care about that. It's ugly, it's rusting, but it, it now has a leak. So you go in there and it smells like mildew. It smells horrible. And the air conditioning quit working, (laughs) which is, uh, it might be a deal breaker. The Mazda 5 might need to find a new home. So I should just spend the money and get a car with that everything works that doesn't stink. But yeah, I can't really think of any other pain points, Brad. Life is good. Okay. Wow. Doug, anything jump to mind? I've been strategically eliminating these things for a few years. So I'm in a pretty good spot. However, one thing that I did recently, kind of a convenience plus travel, was a vacation that we took to San Diego. And We stayed in the Mission Beach area, which is pretty nice, cool boardwalk, like right on the beach. There's a lot of places you can stay. There's many, many options. But I was like, I want to just walk outside and be on the beach. I don't want to have to drive a quarter mile (laughs) and try to find parking or walk across the busy street. I just want to be right there. So that that's one thing where definitely in the past I would have opted for, you know, something a little bit cheaper. And I would justify it in various ways, like, oh, we could eat more food out, we can get more beer out or whatever. But it was a great decision to just get the place we wanted at the spot we wanted and not compromise on that. And, you know, we had an Airbnb so we can cook inside again. Some of the frugality stuff still sneaks through. But like the biggest thing was being right where we wanted to be. And on that vacation, I decided we're not going to rent a car. That would be more headache. Apparently, I really don't like driving around in traffic. So I was like, that would be more of a headache. (laughs) Yeah, there's a theme here. And uh, let's take an Uber if we have to go anywhere and it'll be fine. And in the long run, it's actually probably cheaper to get an Uber unless you're like driving all over the place, which we were not because we got the cool place that we were right on the beach. So we didn't need to go anywhere. Yeah, that is huge. And I think that's one of the things we've also hit on is finding the precise micro location when we're on vacation because we... Unfortunately, just the season of life we're in now, the girls are busy with school. They're busy during the summer. We're we're just not traveling as much as we used to. So when we are able to travel, it's really important to maximize that. And and I think about something like we, we love a little beach town called Ogunquit in Maine. And Laura and I have been there a couple of times. And it's just one of our favorite places on earth. And the difference between being a mile out of town 
at maybe, and I, I haven't even looked it up, but like maybe a chain where I could use hotel points or things like that and get it for free versus having the exact hotel that we've stayed in now three times and the exact perfect location that's right by the beach, right by town and not having to deal with the traffic because there, there actually is a decent bit of traffic, but it's totally irrelevant and immaterial when you're exactly where we are. That's worth every dollar because we love that town but we actually had friends who stayed in that mile outside of town and their experience on that vacation was dramatically different than ours. It was dramatically worse. So that kind of thing, or just being in, again, a very precise walk. Like we're now optimizing for walkability when we go on vacation. So you go to London and we wanted to stay in a very specific small little town where we could walk to the tube stop or we could walk to the high road. And those kind of things are just, they're critical for me now. And you know, Doug, you mentioned uh, frugality sneaks through. I, I, I know you're saying that jokingly, but I think this is not, and, and I hope nobody's taking away from this conversation that the three of us are not frugal people anymore, that we're not people who save money, that we're not optimizing. Like we're optimizing in different ways. And yeah, I think what's in there is, is a little kind of tacit admission that, that maybe, maybe, and not to put words in your guys' mouth, but that we were a little over the line of frugality at some point. And Again, I, I don't want to sound like I'm a broken record here, but the frugality is important. We're not trying to say it's not. Like it's so important for people finding fi. And I know that's what's hard about a podcast like this is we're speaking to a broad swath of the fi community, and it's very hard to meet everybody in one episode. Obviously, and it, it you can't you can't do that. But I I just want to make it clear that we're not saying go out and blow all your money or being frugal isn't important or being mindful isn't important. Being a valueist isn't important. We're not, we're not saying that at all, but you can over-optimize to your detriment. I think that is the most succinct way that I would want to put it. And you don't want to over-optimize to your detriment. And yeah, I mean, I think Doug, part of life is making choices. And if you can make a choice to, okay, like you said, you like cooking. If we're going to maybe eat in when we go on vacation and get amazing ingredients, maybe you're up in Maine and you get lobster or something like that would be awesome. And that isn't like a frugality sneaking through. That's a, hey, this is another way of experiencing something. And maybe that then enables us because again, money is finite, no matter how much you have, that enables us to spend a little more on the exact micro location we want to be. Like that to me sounds like a fantastic way to think through a financial life. So Brad, I have a question for you about Die With Zero. Bill Perkins, which you mentioned like a thousand times enough, Brad, that you actually got me to read it because <laughs> I, nice. I heard about it for a long time and I thought, ah, I get the point, no need. But finally, I, I did check it out. So this is a tough question for you, but what are a couple ideas from Die With Zero that triggered you? Because I mean, you already had some of the thoughts that we were talking about where, hey, you could spend a little more on your priorities, certain conveniences are great, but what was it? Because that book's not too old. What triggered you? from the book to really change your mindset a little bit. And then, you know, so much inspiration that you're telling a bunch of other people on your podcast to get us to read it too. <laughs> well, I'm glad you read it. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I think to me, the biggest trigger was just very simply my kids. And it was, and this is obviously not the textual reading of it, but it was realizing that time is finite and that, okay, my older daughter is now 15. My younger one is 11, and there is a real chance that in three years, my older daughter goes off to college, and who knows how much more we'll see her. I mean, I, I think there's a reasonable chance that, that we will, but I mean, you think about how many people go off to college, stay where they are for the summer, and then go live somewhere else. And in, in which case, when she hits 18, that essentially is 95 plus percent of the time that I'll ever spend with her. And I know I've talked about the article, The Tail End by Tim Urban on Wait But Why. And, and that, that's where a lot of that came from. But there was just something about how Bill Perkins put his message in Die With Zero that, that just made me realize just how finite life is. And that was kind of the lightning bolt of you think of yourself, like I still think of myself as a pretty young guy, but yet you just, you just have to do the math, right? Like, okay, 44 years old. If I'm still healthy at 84, you know, I, I'm on a pretty good trajectory, but what is healthy at, at 84 for me look like? I don't know. So maybe, maybe I've got 40 years, maybe it's 30 of real, real health span. Okay. So that's 30 years. That's 30 more summers. That's 
how many more trips? That's how many more times am I going to go to the beach? That's how many more times am I going to travel to X anywhere? Oh, Gunkwit, I've mentioned, right? Like we've been there three or four times. How many more times realistically am I going to go to a Gunkwit in my life? Could be zero, could be one. You never know when something is the last time. That was another thing that jumped out to me is you just never know sometimes when it's the last time. But maybe being more mindful of, hey, this could be the last time. Like I think he talked about like wakeboarding or something like that. It was like, all right, look, you know, just based on where I am in my life, I'm not going to do wakeboarding after I'm 50. So this is literally the last time. And he said it to himself in the moment. And I think in a weird way, that allows you more enjoyment of the experience. And it has definitely changed my way of thinking in terms of how I relate to my kids and how I think about the time we have. And I've mentioned a couple of times here on the show that I was thinking about going to Taylor Swift with my older daughter and we pulled the trigger. And actually, when we're recording this, I'm getting ready to drive to Pittsburgh here in about about one hour, maybe right after we hit stop. And we're going to see Taylor tomorrow. You know, I bought the tickets. We've been looking forward to it now for a couple of weeks. And I think like as Bill Perkins said, another thing, Doug, that jumped out to me was the memory dividends. That's a, a phrase he used, which is we can talk about and think about this shared experience forever now. And I mean, there's a high likelihood this will be the best concert either of us ever go to in our entire lives. And I mean, I've been to see Pearl Jam. I've seen Billy Joel a bunch of times. Like I saw that Bono thing, like Dave Matthews band when he was getting started. Like I've seen a lot of good concerts and there's a reasonable likelihood this is going to be the best one. And especially that I'm going with Anna. And now it's like, oh, okay, well, Molly, my younger one, isn't going on this trip. We're going to take a trip together to New York City in August. That was like my, hey, this is the special thing we're going to do. I wouldn't have done either of those things before I read Die With Zero. I just simply wouldn't have. And that's the way. And Doug, obviously, I could keep going on and on here, but uh, nobody wants to hear me yap for 30 minutes straight. But like, those are the kind of lighting bolts that I've had from reading that book. I love it, man. What's your uh, favorite Taylor Swift song? Ooh, well, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the song All Too Well is probably my favorite and might be the best song ever written. Like the, it's just a brilliant, beautiful song. The 10 minute version, I would highly recommend. Yeah, that's probably my favorite one. She is an amazing songwriter. Like it's just truly remarkable. Carl and I are newer to Taylor Swift, but we're really trying. Yeah, my uh, so my older daughter got a ticket. My younger one did not, but wants to go. I don't think she's really a true fan. She just sees all the hype around it and wants <laughs> to go. So I've been debating whether or not to pull the trigger, but uh, I don't know. I might do it. Yeah. Doug, you want to go with us? Yeah, I guess so. I guess if I'm talking like that, I guess I got to <laughs> go too. All right. You're getting the tickets. <laughs> you Swifties. <laughs> all right, guys, I know you both read Dive Zero, but Doug, since you were the one who asked me, I'm going to turn around immediately on you and put you on the hot seat. So what were the the takeaways for you or were there any lighting bolt moments? The biggest thing was sort of time bucketing your life. And there's certain things that we are capable of doing and really enjoying now in our 40s that if we try to do it in our 60s, it may not be very fun or we may not want to do it at all or 70s or whatever. So that could be, you know, summiting a mountain, right? It could be really, really fun in the next, say like 10 or 15 years, uh, knock on wood, we'll all be healthy enough and in shape to do something like that. But we have this limited time and you have to, you know, don't forget, it's really easy to be complacent. I mean, I spent a lot of my 20s and 30s like drinking way too much, which I'm probably going to pay for, you know, in the future. And if I would have been a little bit smarter about it, I would have done a few more things at the right time frame. Bill gives examples in his book where in your 20s, maybe you'll stay in hostels or less than ideal lodging situations. But now we're old. <laughs> we're old guys and we want a little <laughs> bit more comfort. You know, maybe we don't want to share. I mean, I love rooming with Carl at conferences, but sometimes maybe we want to have our own room, just have a little more space so he doesn't have to listen to me snore, for example. <laughs> but but little things like that where like as time goes on, you know, maybe we won't want to do those things or we physically won't be able to. So that that was huge. And I'm trying to think about that and strategically think about, you know, five or 10 year increments and like looking at people who are older than us and like how in shape are they? Like, what can they do? Am I going to be able to be in that good of shape when I'm that old? Do I have that kind of discipline? And I don't know if I do. So time buckets. Yeah, time buckets. That's really important. And and yeah, it's funny. Another person that I that I constantly reference is Dr. Peter Atia. 
and his book Outlive came out recently. And it, it's very, very dense. But if for people who don't follow Atia, I, th- I would highly recommend that book. He talks about the centenarian Olympics and basically how he conceptualizes that is, okay, what are the 10 things I want to do as a healthy 90-year-old, in essence? So pick up a grandkid as, or great-grandkid as they run to you from across the room. All right, well, that, that takes a lot of skill if you really think about it. You have to stabilize, you have to squat down, you have to pick them back up, or putting a bag in an overhead compartment as opposed to needing somebody else to help you. So, okay, at 90, that's what I want to do, but what do I need to do today? Because if, let's say, that kid weighs 20 pounds, if you can only front squat with like a kettlebell 20 pounds today at 40, well, there's a 0% chance you can do that at 90 then because your body is going to break down. There's just very simple, just the math of it. So you probably need to be able to do a 50-pound goblet squat or a 70-pound, something like that, right? And work backwards and realize, okay, there's going to be some loss. That doesn't mean it's going to be catastrophic, but I need to think about that. Again, it's a mental framework for how do I think about what do I want my life to look like? What do I want to be able to do? Walk around a city that I go visit. I'd love to be able to do that at 80. I think that's perfectly possible. I see no reason why I can't. But if I sat around from 44 until 80, there's no chance. Zero percent. So yeah, I think that's important to think about. And, and Carl, I know you read Die With Zero also and had a big takeaway. I'd love to hear about that as well. Yeah, Die With Zero is great. I'm pretty stuck in my way, so it's rare I read something that changes a strongly held thought I had. But what Bill mentions in the book is most people wait till they die to give their money away to their kids or to charities or whatever. So if you're 80 and you die, your kids are probably in their 50s, let's say, that money isn't going to have the effect on their life that it could if you gave it to them at a younger age. And I'm not saying paying for college, which I'll probably do. I'm talking about, Bill mentions this in his book, perhaps helping them when they're in their early 30s, when they've got a good head on their shoulders, they've probably met a good partner by that time. If you could do something like buy them a house or give them a significant amount of money at that age, you're probably going to change their lives. And it's not going to have nearly the same effect as if you do that when you die. So that's one thought. And the other one I think about is why wait till you die to give your money away? And to be clear, I don't want my name on anything. I'll probably Hmm. give a bunch of money to our library, but how cool would it be to see that money in action when I'm still alive versus the thought of knowing it's going to go to them after I croak, but I'm not going to be able to see any of that. So if things keep going well for us, I look forward to perhaps, I don't want to die with zero. That's too close to uh, the line for me. But giving most of it away and seeing my money in action to my family and to causes I care about before I buy the farm. Yeah, I love that. And I agree. And I don't think most people in our orbit would want to give money away just to get their stupid name on a building. Like that, that just seems like such a colossal waste to me. But yeah, is there value you can add to the world with that money? And like you're saying with your kids, and I, I think, and this might be a longer separate conversation, but, but your entire thought process, I know. Over the years, you've hinted about, not hinted necessarily, as much as questioned, hey, do I give my kids anything? Do I pay for college? Like I I know you and Mindy have thought about what is this going to do to them? And I think it sounds as if your thinking has been updated in that just saying like, hey, we're probably going to pay for college or we're thinking about giving them money at at an earlier age. I think there was a time where you were thinking about like, they're just not going to get money. They're going to have to be self-made on some level. Is my recollection right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. My thought was that my kids should have to go through the same trials and tribulations that I had. And that is take out a bunch of loans and put themselves through school because I thought, like me, that might help them make a better decision about what they wanted to study. I was very deliberate because I knew I'd have to pay for it myself. So I thought that I had to put my children through the same thing. And I don't think you have to do that. I still want them to be thoughtful about it and not study something ridiculous. And I might still put some rules around it. But like one thought I've had, Brad, is maybe I'll just give them an equivalent amount of money of what it would cost to go to school. And they can do, I don't want to say whatever they want with it, but I don't think school is a slam dunk. Maybe they want to start a business or try to be an entrepreneur in some way. And I'd I'd have to put some more thought into this, put some guardrails around it. But yeah, I have updated my thinking, Brad, and mostly because I don't want them to, to stress either, uh, especially our, our older one, Claire. She's like, oh, I'm so worried about the loans I'd have to get. I'm like, no, 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 Claire, you don't understand. We're, you'll be taken care of one way or the other. Yeah, I, I like that. And I, I think just, again, the thoughtfulness as opposed to 
this is our reflexive answer, or this is what I've always thought. And maybe I haven't updated that thinking in 10 or 20 years. So that's just what we're going to do. And I think a lot of people do, they just stick their heads in the sand and they don't think about things. And I think that's part of what we in the five community do best is we try to think through problems. We see the world as it is. And we understand that you have to update your thinking because new information is always rolling in. And part of this that Perkins talked about, and Carl, you mentioned this before is, hey, okay, probably you're going to live into your 90s. And in which case, then your children are going to be in their 60s. Or maybe who knows, uh, who knows where advances take us. And are your kids really going to get value in getting millions of dollars in their 60s or 70s when a good portion of their life has already gone by? Like, that seems like the least optimal way to do it, as opposed to, hey, if you gave them enough money for a down payment for a house when they were 25 and they could house hack and then propel themselves to, okay, this is an asset I have and I can cut my living expenses down to almost zero or they can learn how to real estate invest as you're talking about. I might give them that pot of money you're saying. That to me seems so much more optimal than giving them a million dollars when they're 75 and their whole life has gone by and they don't, they either don't need it, which is the most likely circumstance, or if they need it, they could have used it 30 years prior and would have had a dramatically less stressful and better life at that point. So yeah, it's again, we're not giving prescriptions here. I think that's a massive takeaway. It's just like, guys, it's the thought process, right? Like just the fact that we're thinking about this. And if we were sitting around a table five years ago, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. Yeah, I think you're right. absolutely right, Brad. It's uh, so interesting. I think this is a fun way to live too. Like you said, Brad, you intercept new information and then you change your thoughts on it. I think that's very, very healthy. Carl, that is the perfect way to end the episode. And I think 99 times out of 100, I would end it right there and not try to talk more because that was that was the perfect stopping point. But I'm one of those people who has to close the loop on something that we talked about before. Like, I, I always hate those podcasters that like, oh, we're going to talk about this later in the episode and they don't get to it. And it's like, no, you had to. I like, need <laughs> to close the loop. So I mentioned that, Carl, you had something amazing that you did in your life around music and a concert experience. I, I'd love if you could just tell the audience to, to close out here. Yeah. So I grew up in Chicago and there was this band that got uh, kind of big in Chicago. They were much bigger in the UK and they were called the Webb Brothers. And I got into their music and I really liked it. Probably one of my top three bands of all time. And they're about the same age as me and they kind of faded away for a bit. But then I read, I think it was a Facebook post that they were starting a Kickstarter campaign. And if you don't know what Kickstarter is, that's when someone wants to raise money. And if they raise the amount of money that they need, then everyone gets this prize. If they don't, then no one gets it. And prize might be, in this case, it was a record. And you actually had the opportunity to buy a concert for $10,000. And I saw this, I'm like, holy cow. And I'm going to date myself a little bit here, Brad. I thought about Fast Times at Ridgemont Eye. Have you ever <laughs> seen that movie? Yeah, yeah. Where uh, Spicoli wins money from saving Brooke Shields from drowning and he blows it all on paying Van Halen to play in his backyard. So I'm like, <laughs> wow, this is my Van Halen moment. I could have one of my favorite bands in the world play in my backyard. They said they would come anywhere. But then I'm like, no, this is completely ridiculous. There's no way I'm going to do this. I'm not even going to entertain this. But for the heck of it, I tweeted it. And the reason I tweeted it was, thinking back on it now, I was looking for reassurance that not doing this was the right idea. I wanted the FI community to tell me that I was crazy for even <laughs> considering this thing. And then I think, Brad, you might have been one of the first ones to respond. You might have been first and said, you should totally do this. The memory dividends will pay off for the rest of your life. And I was taken aback. I'm like, wow, I have so much respect for Brad. And he's telling me I should do this thing. And then I remember Joel Arsgaard from How to Money, another good friend, said, yeah, you should totally do this. I'm like, wow, I, <laughs> these people are saying this. So I, <laughs> I went to Mindy. I'm like, hey, um, you know, this concert thing, because I had mentioned it to her offhandedly. I'm like, people are saying I should do this. What do you think? And that was, uh, if she would have said no, I would have not done it. She's like, nah, if you really want to do it, go for it. So I pulled the trigger and here hey. I am, a $10,000 concert in Longmont on August 26th, uh, open to everyone, but especially friends of the band. So if you're in town, come to Longmont in, in August. <laughs> Just come to Longmont and find it. Is there uh, <laughs> do people get in touch with you through your website? Yeah, they can send me an email, uh, Mr. 1500 at 1500days.com. But yeah, seriously, I would, uh, if there's any fans of the band, and there have been some that have reached out, please come and see this. It's going to be awesome. Two sets, and it's going to be great. That is so cool. Gentlemen, 
This was fantastic. I really appreciate it. I feel like we can and should do a part two. I know we had a, a long outline and we got to about half of it. So this is the first, I think, of many of these conversations because this, I think, is where a lot of us who have been in the FI community for a while, with the phase we're in right now. And I think it's important. I think it's important for the evolution because, again, we've always talked about FI is not zero or one. It's not just, hey, I hit that number on the screen and then my life is wonderful. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of work that goes into building a life that you want to live into. And I think this is part of it, this spending for happiness. And it's an evolution, as we've all talked about here. This is not something where you flip a switch and it's easy because we've built up this skill of spending and maybe, maybe some of that deprivation mindset over many years. And it doesn't just flip. So I think part of this intentionality that we're applying to it is just, it's really important. So thank you both for being here. I know people can reach out to you, milehighfi.com and obviously the Mile High Fi podcast, which is fantastic. Is there anywhere else you want to direct people to? I think that sounds good. What's our email address that I can never remember, Doug? <laughs> it's in the show notes for our show. So if people go to the show, they could check Ooh, it out. Any like complaints, it. go to Carl <laughs> at uh, milehighfi.com. Cool. Compliments, go to Doug. <laughs> at milehighfi.com. Nice. Sounds like a plan, guys. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. And uh, until next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brad.